Hey guys, good morning again and welcome back to your Unacademy Neat English channel. Well, in this particular session, again, it's going to be a quick revision of the chapter Chemical Kinetics, right? My dear students, the first thing which we discuss in the Chemical Kinetics, that is the average rate of reaction, which is defined as change in the concentration of either reactants or products divided by time interval or change in the pressure of either reactants or products divided by time interval, right? With the sign plus minus. Plus means that the concentration of product increases with time. Minus indicates that concentration of reactant decreases with time. Then we have got instantaneous rate of reaction. Instantaneous rate of reaction. Whenever you will have to calculate rate of reaction in a very, very, very small time interval, right? That means delta T approaching towards zero. That rate which we calculate in a short interval of time is what you call as instantaneous rate of reaction, right? So, how do you calculate, how do you convert average rate of reaction into instantaneous? It is delta C upon delta T, limit delta T approaching towards zero. And how do you represent it? Simply DC upon DT. What is DC upon DT? It is basically the slope of the tangent at a point on concentration versus time curve, right? Now, people, if you'll be having a balanced chemical equation, wherein N1, N2 are the stoichiometric coefficients of reactants and products, you can define rate of disappearance, you can define rate of appearance, you can define rate of reaction. How exactly? Rate of disappearance of reactant is equal to minus change in the concentration of reactant divided by time interval. Rate of appearance of product is equal to plus change in the concentration of product divided by time interval. And if you will have to calculate rate of reaction, you can calculate that either with respect to A or with respect to B. With respect to A, it's going to be minus because we are starting with reactant, 1 by stoichiometric coefficient change in the concentration of A divided by time interval. If you are calculating it with respect to product, you will be starting with plus sign, 1 divided by stoichiometric coefficient, change in the concentration of B divided by time interval. Then, then comes your, a, a law, that's what you call as law of mass section, which is a complete theoretical concept. As per law of mass section, rate of reaction is directly proportional to the product of active masses of reactants raised to the power their stoichiometric coefficients, right? And when you modify this law of mass section, it gets converted into rate law, which says that rate of reaction is equal to rate constant multiplied by concentration of A raised power X, concentration of B raised power Y. Okay, this X and Y, this X is what you call as order with respect to A, Y is called as order with respect to B. And when you take the sum of this X and Y, it gives you basically the overall order of the reaction, right? So basically, we have got two ways to calculate rate. One is with the help of law of mass section, one is with the help of rate law. With the help of law of mass section, you get theoretical rate. With the help of rate law, you get experimental rate. There will be some reactions for which uh, theoretical and experimental rate comes out to be equal. But for some reactions, your theoretical and actual rate, they do not come out to be equal. That means your x, your x is not always equal to n1, your y is not always equal to n2. But in some reactions, x will be equal to n1 and y will be equal to n2. Okay. Then as per chemical kinetics point of view, we classify reactions into two types. One is called as simple or elementary reactions. One is called as complex reaction. Elementary reactions are the ones which gets completed in a single step. Complex reactions are the one which gets completed in more than one step. My dear students, I told you there are few reactions for which, for which theoretical rate and experimentally determined rate, they come out to be equal. That means there are some reactions for which X is equal to N1, Y is equal to N2. Which are those reactions? Those are elementary reactions. So for elementary reactions, whether you want to calculate rate with the help of law of mass section or with the help of rate law, from both the things, you get the same value, right? Then comes the term molecularity. I, I'm pretty much sure you would have heard about this, right? How do we define the molecularity? My dear students, as per your collision theory is concerned, for the reaction to happen, for the reaction to proceed, I must say reacting species must collide first. Now, the number of reacting species which must collide simultaneously to form the products that defines the molecularity. And based on that, you have got different types of reaction. Unimolecular with molecularity 1, bimolecular, molecularity 2, trimolecular, molecularity 3 and so on. Right? Well, there are few things which you need to remember about molecularity. That molecularity, it can never be 0, it can never be negative, it can never be fractional. Right? And those reactions which have got molecularity greater than 3, they are rarely found right? Because the probability of more than three reacting species to collide simultaneously, that probability is very less. That is the reason why those reactions which have got molecularity greater than three, they are rarely found. They are rarely observed, right? 
an important statement, my dear students, for an elementary reaction. Whenever you see an elementary reaction, its order and molecularity will be always the same. Now, if I particularly talk about order, order is first of all an experimentally determined quantity. Order can be zero, order can be positive, right? Order can be fractional. Remember, order with respect to any reactant, order with respect to any reactant can be negative, but overall order of the reaction can never be negative. So that means X can be negative, Y can be negative, but X plus Y can never be negative, right? Similarly, there is one more thing which I would want to tell you, a zero order reaction, is always complex. Zero order reaction can never be elementary, right? Why? Zero order reaction can never be elementary. Why is that? Because if zero order reaction was elementary, then its molecularity should have been zero. But molecularity is equal to zero. It does not have any physical significance, right? And my dear students, at the same time, the molecularity which I'm talk about, talking about, it is particularly defined for which reactions? The concept is valid. The concept is defined for elementary reactions, right? Now, what about the units of rate constant? Units of rate constant is based on, it is based on the order of the reaction, right? In general, we say the units of rate constant are moles, liter inverse, whole raised power 1 minus n, and second inverse, right? If time is in seconds. This n represents the order of the reaction. Or ATM raised power 1 minus n, second inverse where n is the order of the reaction. Based on the order, you can put the values of n. If, if zero order reaction, n is zero. For first order reaction, n is one, and so on. Accordingly, you can get the units of your rate constant. Now, particularly if you talk about the zero order reactions, right? Zero order reactions are the ones in which rate of reaction is independent of the concentration of reactant. So if you want to change the concentration of reactant, right? If you want to increase or decrease the concentration of reactant, nothing happens to the rate of the zero order reaction. So zero order reactions are the ones for which rate is independent of the concentration of reactant. That's the reason why I have written the rate law in this format. R is equal to rate is equal to rate constant, concentration of reactant raised power zero. So independent, right? Now, the integrated rate equation in case of the zero order, AT is equal to A naught minus KT. Your half-life, A naught divided by 2K. Completion time, A naught divided by K. Zero order reaction, if you look at these two equations, you can conclude one thing. Zero order reaction is completed in two half-lives, right? Similarly, this is one more expression which is related to zero order reactions, right? And there are certain graphs which you should know, which you should remember about the zero order reaction. First one, that is between rate versus concentration of reactant is independent, right? Alpha versus A naught, this is alpha here, alpha and A naught, they are inversely proportional. So the graph has to be hyperbola, right? Uh, units of rate constant, I already told you. AT versus T curve, AT versus T curve, it's a straight line with a negative slope, slope is equal to minus K, similarly, T half versus A naught. It's a straight line with the slope 1 divided by 2K where K is the rate constant of the reaction, right? So this is all about the zero order reaction and do remember it's three examples. These are its main examples. One is photochemical reaction between H2 and Cl2. One is decomposition of NH3 over molybdenum and one is decomposition of HI over gold. These are the three important reactions which are the perfect examples of the zero order kinetics, right? Moving on to first order reaction. What are first order reactions? First order reaction is the one in which rate varies linearly with the concentration of reactant. Rate varies linearly with the concentration of reactant. That means if you double the concentration of reactant, rate doubles. If you triple it, rate triples, etc, etc. Right? Number one. Number two, all these forms which I've mentioned over here, these are the different forms of the integrated rate equation for the first order kinetics. First one is ln of AT is equal to ln of A0 minus KT, right? What is A0 and what is AT? A0 is the initial concentration of reactant and AT is the concentration of reactant left at any time t, right? Log of AT is equal to log of A0 minus K divided by 2.303 multiplied by t. And these are the other different expressions. One thing which I have forgotten over here, time taken to complete X percent of the zero order reaction. How do you calculate, sorry, first order reaction? How do you calculate that? 2.303 divided by K. It is log of 100 divided by 100 minus X, right? Now, how much time does it take to complete? How much time does it take to complete 100% of the first order reaction? Let me tell you, a first order reaction never undergoes 100% completion. It takes infinite time to complete. Time taken to complete 75% reaction is 2 times half-life. 87.5 is 3 times half-life. 99.9% of the reaction is 10 times half-life. Similarly, degree of dissociation in case of the first order is calculated in this format. 1 minus E raised per minus KT for the reaction A gives B, right? Similarly, 
concentration of reactant left after n half lives which you would have studied in radioactivity as well a naught divided by 2 raised per n where n represents number of half lives which is total time divided by t half right similarly this is one more expression which is particularly valid for what which is particularly valid for your first order reaction where a t1 is the concentration of reactant at time t1 a t2 is the concentration of reactant at time t2 moving ahead these are few graphs right these are few graphs related to your zero order and first order kinetics. If you talk about zero order reaction, this is rate versus concentration of reactant, A T versus T, T half versus A naught, alpha versus A naught. In the similar way, these are some of the graphs which are related to your first order reactions which you should know. Because sometimes, a lot of times basically, question is asked from the graphs as well. And by means of these graphs, you can identify which reaction is your zero order and which reaction is your first order. Now, there is one important theory that's what you call as collision theory. Collision theory says that for the reaction to happen, the reacting species must collide, right? Must collide effectively. Now, for the collision to be effective, for the collision to be effective, there are two parameters which exactly decide whether the collision is going to be effective or not. One is called as energy factor, one is called as orientation factor. Energy factor tells you that only those reacting species will collide effectively. Only those reacting species will form the products, right? which have got energy greater or equal to activation energy, right? This is the criteria for the collision to be effective as per energy factor. For the reaction to happen, right? For the reaction to ha happen, for the collision to be effective between reacting species as per energy factor, energy of reactants has to be greater or equal to activation energy. Then only they can cross this particular energy barrier and form the products, right? Now, the fraction of molecules which have got energy greater or equal to activation energy, that's given by this particular parameter, you call it as the Boltzmann's factor, right? More the value of this term, more reacting species will cross the barrier and more will be the product formation, right? Similarly, similarly, my dear students, there is one more term that is ZAB, collision frequency. Number of collisions per unit time per unit volume, right? More the collision frequency, more will be the collisions between the reacting species, more collisions means more is the probability of the effective collision. If effective collision probability is more, that absolutely tells you that rate will be more, right? Similarly, as per orientation factor, reacting species have to collide in such a way that uh, the steric hindrance has to be minimized basically, right? So in short, I would say more reacting species have to collide in proper orientation. And this is one equation as per collision theory by means of which you calculate rate. This is the orientation factor, this is collision frequency, and this is the Boltzmann's factor. And my dear students, these are the two graphs. One is for endothermic reaction, one is for exothermic reaction. This gap represents activation energy of forward, this backward. Similarly, here this is forward, and this is backward, and this is one equation from which question is frequently asked, uh, delta H, which is EAF minus EAB, activation energy of forward minus activation energy of backward. Now the last topic of this particular chapter, that is Arrhenius equation, which exactly tells you that on increasing the temperature, rate constant of the reaction increases and eventually rate increases, right? So on increasing the temperature, rate actually increases. Perfect. Now, this is the first form of the Arrhenius equation. K is equal to A e raised power minus A by RT. This is the second form. This is the third form. This is the fourth form. You have to remember all, right? Because questions are directly asked from these particular equations, right? Rate constant, it has been observed that rate constant of a reaction doubles or becomes even more upon increasing the temperature by 10 degree. So whenever you have the reaction, if you increase the temperature of the reaction by 10 degree, the rate constant exactly doubles or slightly becomes more, right? Uh, over here, you can define the temperature coefficient, right, of any reaction, which is basically rate constant at temperature T plus 10 Kelvin divided by rate constant of the reaction, right, at temperature T. And let me tell you this n value over here, it varies between 2 and 3. It is greater or equal to 2, less than 3, right? Now, my dear students, one more particular type of question is asked. Uh, on changing the temperature from 10 degree to 100 degree, how many times rate will increase? These sort of questions you would have seen. For those questions, this is the equation which you'll be using. R2 divided by R1 is equal to 2 raised per delta T, change in temperature divided by time, right? And these are the two graphs which I would want all of you to remember over here when it comes to the Arrhenius equation. Perfect. I believe this was a very quick revision of the chapter kinetics, right? First, go through the detailed marathon of kinetics, then you are fit enough to do your revision from this particular session, right? So with this, I'll be taking leave.
God bless you and take care guys. Bye-bye.